Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Worship with Centennial United Methodist Church at Ivy. We are grateful, we are delighted that you are choosing to set aside time in your week to find renewal and uh, rest in the word and the hope of God. So thank you for joining us. We come here for, for one reason and one reason only, and that is to worship God. So let us begin to worship God today um, as we share a bit about the announcements, the things that are going on with us this week. Um, first, today we are going to celebrate communion. So if you are worshiping with us at home, uh, we invite you to have elements ready towards the end of our service when we will celebrate communion together. And um, so today we have a worship committee after uh, church. We have a meeting with the worship committee. So if you serve on that, uh, you have a Zoom link in your email inbox. We'll meet at 1145 today, or you can come here to the church with your mask on and, and meet with us. And then tomorrow night, we're going to have a quick education meeting. It will be on Zoom. It'll be at 7 o'clock. Um, and I've heard from enough folks who said that they can be there for that. So we will quickly meet for just 30 minutes tomorrow evening at 7. If you're on education, you'll receive a Zoom link for that um, and information about how to connect on Zoom today. You'll, you'll receive that today. As we begin worship, we hear words from Bell Hooks who wrote a book titled All About Love. And this is what she has to say about love. This is our centering moment today. Bell Hooks writes, when angels speak of love, they tell us it is only by loving that we enter an earthly paradise. They tell us paradise is our home and love our true destiny. May it be so, amen. Will you join me as we proclaim this call to worship together? Because love is patient. Help me to be slow to judge and quick to listen. Because love is kind. Help my words be gentle and my actions to be thoughtful. Because love is not proud or boastful. Help me have a humble heart that sees the good in others because love is not rude or self-seeking, help me speak words that are easy on the ear and on the heart, because love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Help me stand up for the defenseless, because love always protects, trusts, and perseveres. Help my heart continually beat with love for you and others. Amen. Let's begin our worship today in a happy way by singing, Oh Happy Day That Fixed My Choice. Thank you. 
begin our time of prayer today, let's sing this first verse of Be Thou My Vision. For Leslie Lynch's sister Katie, who had surgery over a week ago and continues to recover. We pray for her in her recovery from surgery and also for those who offer care to her. We continue to pray for Pastor David Wendell and his wife Jane. Dave, David has returned home after a recent hospital stay and after he tested positive for COVID-19. We pray for Jane and David both as he continues to recover and receive care from home. We offer prayers for the Purcell family as Amos's father died this past week. For all who grieve his death and for those who remember his life, we pray for compassion and comfort. We lift up Cleo Mahoney, who is Pat 80's sister, um, who had a recent fall and was receiving care at Mercy Hospital as well as care for um, her pain and discomfort from shingles and other health issues. We continue to pray for her healing and for her care in the coming days. We continue to pray for George and Janet Sietzma as George recovers from a recent surgery after having a difficult year with health issues. We continue to pray for the family and friends of Herman Clark who died last Sunday morning and for all those who remember and give thanks for his life, we keep them in our prayers. We continue to pray for Matthew Myers and his recovery at home from surgery that he had earlier this month. Can we continue to pray for Mo Gilkison's recovery as Mo continues to receive care at Park Ridge Specialty Care in Pleasant Hill. Mo continues to give thanks to all of you who are sending prayers and cards he feels your love and he gives thanks. We lift up Mary Ferguson this week as Mary undergoes knee surgery on Wednesday. We pray for those caring for her and we pray we offer prayers of comfort and rest toward her full recovery. We continue to pray for care and comfort for the family and friends of Bob Morrison who died this past month and we received a beautiful thank you card um, from Bob's family. Uh, it says to all of us here at Ivy, thank you very much for the beautiful sympathy bouquet for our father's funeral services. It was much appreciated and brought needed breath of life into a difficult time for our family. They give thanks for the youth fellowship meetings that they remember here um, at, that they, when they came to the church with their mom, Donnelly Morrison, and they're very thankful for our presence in this community during this globally different time. So that is a thank you letter from Mike, Lynn, and Lori, Bob Morrison's family. So thank you to them and we continue to pray for their sweet family. And lastly, lastly, we continue to pray for people who are all in a season of receiving care and treatments, including Cindy, Kathy Johnston, Desiree, Forrest Kidman, Jackie Smith, Nancy Dorrell, and Kathy King. consecrated in your name for discipleship and for service. May you encounter us in this hour so that we may grow in knowledge and in action. 
disturb our certainties this day, Lord, so that we might be open to new insights, gently upset our priorities to make room for more faith, more hope, more love than we currently have. Expand our horizons to encompass ideas we have not entertained before. For if anyone can uncomfortably expand our boundaries for whom we deem worthy of your love, it is you, our loving Lord. Help us not be ruled by our feels, fears and instead by our faith, so we can let go of our judgments and our inabilities to forgive. When we are afraid to believe and to hope in the power of love, may your grace remind us to step out into the fearful and into the uncomfortable as the new path that you lay down for us. You are there among us on any and all journeys. Equip us to be better listeners and to embody your love that is truly patient rather than reactive, to your love that is truly kind, rather than manipulative. With awe and wonder before you, we pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today our scripture is an entire chapter. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You've probably heard Paul's words here to the church at Corinth, um, but let us try to hear God's words, God's new words in these words now. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All praise to the living word. As we reflect on these words, let's sing a hymn. It's Together We Serve. Together we serve. 
Loving God, we come to worship today seeking your holy love so that we may become whole and loving. As Jesus Christ shared the life of earth, may we too share in this life with Christ as we grow in holiness and justice and in love. We give thanks for your holy presence among us, Lord. Help us reflect on your love now that became flesh among us. Amen. Although my brother and I grew up in the same house, we have grown up to be quite different from each other. He drives slow on the highway, and sometimes I read speed limit signs as suggestions. <laughs> he is, however, fast on the racetrack, while my one and only attempt at racing on a dirt track ended up with me in very last place, and that's a story for another time when I'm not so upset still. My older brother, he enjoys baseball and I like basketball. He cheers for the Iowa State Cyclones and I cheer for the Kansas Jayhawks who might be having their worst season in decades. While I had to get braces as a teenager, and I still get cavities, my brother Taylor has had perfect teeth since day one. He never had braces, he's never had one cavity in his 30 years of life, and he likes to remind me that, of that every six months when he goes to the dentist on time, might I add. I don't always do that. A lot of our differences have caused us to argue throughout the years, as you can probably imagine. Sometimes we argue without knowing what we're even arguing about. We just know that we're arguing for the sake of arguing. And man, does it feel good when I know I am right. I don't think one has to have a sibling to know this kind of arguing, though. In some circumstances, I have found myself arguing similarly with classmates, colleagues, my husband, <coughs> my friends, and mere strangers, all simply because we hold different beliefs and opinions, and at the end of the day, we just want to feel that we are right. And if Paul were writing to my brother and I about our arguing today, then his letter would read probably a lot like this first letter to the Corinthians, even if we might not realize that from just reading this 13th chapter, the chapter known about love. While the 13th chapter of Paul's first letter is often quoted at wedding ceremonies reminding us of the beautiful power of love, the entire letter reads quite different from just this one chapter. 
In the chapters leading up to this 13th chapter, we find Paul wrestling with a grumpy group of Christ followers more interested in arguing and being right than living into compassionate community. Like some of the arguments that my brother and I have, the Corinthians are found arguing over differences in opinions, perhaps arguing simply for the sake of arguing. In the 11th verse of the first chapter, Paul quickly follow, follows his greeting to the church by pointing out how he has heard that they are arguing. He writes, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. The Corinthian community is arguing with each other about who and whose they are. Are they, Paul, are they followers of Paul? Are they followers of Apollos? Are they followers of Christ? They disagree with each other on their sole purpose. And Paul writes this first letter, or at least the first letter we have access to in Scripture. He writes to them to inform them that sometimes being right isn't more important than being love. Of course, there are other arguments that Paul points out throughout the letter. The Corinthians, they can't agree on who they place their devotion to. They don't agree on how one reveals their devotion properly or who ought to receive praise for their faithfulness or whether or not pride is a sin. Nor can they agree on how grace is truly offered by Christ and lived throughout our lives and so much more. And immediately before the 13th chapter, we find Paul explaining how to worship one God who grants us many gifts. You've probably heard or you might remember um, this story that Paul shares in the 12th chapter. Paul wants the Corinthians to know that they do not all have to agree on everything in order to live in a faithful community. They are not required to live out their ministries the same way, for our one God can and does call us all down different journeys. We may be made in the same image of the same God, but our callings on earth are not the same. This is where Paul provides the community with the one body metaphor, where he writes, Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. One community worshiping one God can still have diverse traits, gifts, callings, and opinions. Living out as one body or one community does not erase our individual identities in Christ. And as Paul further describes how the Corinthians ought to faithfully live in community with one another, he ends his one body with many members metaphor with this 13th chapter, the chapter on love. In this chapter, we find out what love is, what love isn't, and how love manifests in our one body, one community with its many members. Paul's chapter on love it doesn't show up in the middle of a wedding ceremony, even if that's how we might read Paul's words each time we hear this chapter read in a wedding. Noticing his context, however, helps us understand why Paul writes this chapter. His words are not for a couple preparing to enter marital bliss, but instead he directs his words to a quarreling community, to adults fighting like siblings, to people still learning how to put their love into action. Starting in verse 4, Paul describes love in such a powerful way. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. He says love does not rejoice in wrongdoing or in injustice, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Paul's writing is gorgeous. No wonder we quote his description at every wedding. But instead of obsessing over this love that's reserved solely for partners entering marriage, perhaps we ought to read it every Sunday morning 
that we gather for worship to remind us of the very purpose for our gathering as compassionate Christians. What's interesting about Paul's description is not that it's just some random list that comes from thin air for how he describes love. When we read the chapter on its own, it becomes easy to interpret this description in a way that assumes Paul writes this list for no reason for it. But if we look closely at the issues um, at, of the church at Corinth, then we can find that Paul uses these specific descriptions for love in the 13th chapter based on everything the church is struggling with right now. Paul says that love does not envy and it is not jealous, but in chapter 3, verse 3, Paul writes, For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human in inclinations? Paul writes that love does not boast in the 13th chapter, but in chapter 4, verse 7, he writes, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? Paul writes that love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It does not delight in injustice. He writes that in the 13th chapter, but in chapter 6, he points out their assumptions that they are judges rather than God being the judge. As Paul writes, in fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? And Paul writes that love does not insist on its own way, but in chapter 10, Paul just finished writing. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. All that Paul articulates about love in this chapter has to do not with just what we think or what we believe, but most importantly, in what we do. Love is shown, felt, and experienced most often in that which we do. That is why we've wrestled over the last few weeks considering if love is a verb rather than a noun. Are we merely theorists of love or are we willing to be practitioners of love, believing that love manifests best not only in what we say, but mostly in what we do and who we become. Paul's words about what love is and is not reminds me of what one of my seminary professors described as the platinum rule. We've all likely heard that the golden rule of a civilized society is to treat others as you want to be treated, which reinforces what Jesus teaches us as the second greatest commandment, right? To love one's neighbor as oneself. But one of my seminary professors took the golden rule a step further in class one day. She said, it is one thing to treat others as we wish to be treated, but perhaps it is even more difficult to treat others as they wish to be treated. Rather than the golden rule, we discovered this is the platinum rule, teaching us that because love is not self-serving or insistent on its own ways, instead we can focus on extending love that looks different for all of us, for we all have different needs. And if we assume what others need based on our own needs, then perhaps we aren't really becoming love that does not insist on its own way. Paul also makes a connection between time and love in the 13th chapter. When is the best time to love? Well, in the last section of the 13th chapter, Paul shares how the power of love is not fragile, like temporary desires or arguments or issues of the Corinthian church as he refers to the eschaton or the end times. He says that our knowledge, our prophecies, our arguments, our quarrelings, they will all come to an end soon, but love remains even when the complete comes. As modern readers, our interpretations differ quite dramatically from Paul's time, who writes his letters to Christ-following communities in a time when he expected Jesus' return to be immediate. His letter then becomes, as he says in chapter 4, verse 14, it's not, his writing is not a, a shameful mission, but it is a warning. 
Paul's words thus implore the Corinthian church to become love and to dedicate their lives to becoming love as if Jesus were coming tomorrow. I wonder if we did the same thing, if anything would change. Perhaps this is one reason why so many of us in our world still are unsure how to properly love each other. We assume that loving ourselves is more important than becoming uncomfortable to offer love for someone else. Some of us, we, we choose certain neighborhoods to live in out of fear of having to live next to someone who we are not ready yet to consider a neighbor. Some of us, we are unwilling to declare the family member who started debating with us at Christmas dinner about politics we're afraid to admit that they're made in the same image of the same God as we are. Are we willing to have Jesus return to us tomorrow and to see what we've determined as love? Or would we be ashamed of what Christ would find? Another way of asking this same question, I think, uh, it, it causes us to honestly approach ourselves and ask these difficult self-assessing questions about our love in action or, on the other hand, our inactive love, is to have someone ask these three questions that get to the core of our spiritual life. And these questions were written, described by Dr. Robinson, who is a professor of preaching who taught many years at Gordon Conwell Seminary in Massachusetts. These are the three questions that get to the core of our spiritual life, he says. First, do you love God? Second, do you love your neighbors? And third, do you mind if I ask them? I mean, I guess you could ask some of my neighbors if I get to choose which ones. And please, for the love of God, don't ask my brother. And his expression of immediacy by imploring the Corinthians to love each other as if Christ were coming tomorrow, Paul compares his spiritual maturity to the natural aging of a child to an adult. He writes, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For Paul, he's articulating that in his faith, he matured and, and learned that quarreling over minor differences, perceived slights, or just plain presumptions about one another will only get, to, get, get us so far. And Paul goes so far to compare the issues of the community at Corinth to the immaturities of a child. But I, I kind of struggle here with Paul's metaphor, because is it not children that teach us the most about love? Is it not children who reveal to us that love is patient, love is kind? and love is not irritable. I do not know many boastful or resentful children. In fact, the only people that I know that are unwilling to forgive easy, they're adults. So perhaps it is not the personalities of a child that causes us to argue, belittle, envy, and boast, to do all the things that love is not. A few months ago, I received a sweet email from Amy Ferguson, and many of you probably now are thinking, which Amy Ferguson? There's like three or five of them. But Mike and Mary's daughter, Amy Ferguson from Colorado, this Amy Ferguson forwarded me an email that described little lessons about what love means to kids ages four through eight. And I wanna share with you what some of them said about love. Terry, a four-year-old, said that love is what makes you smile when you're tired. And in a pandemic where I've grown tired, I sat down to think of the things that made me smile. A card that surprises me in the mail from someone from the church. An email from a friend who checks in. The smell of chocolate chip cookies in the oven. The list goes on. Those are the things that make me smile. Those are love. An eight-year-old boy named Danny says that love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure the taste is okay. How lovely. Claire, who is six, says my mommy loves me more than anybody. You don't see anyone else kissing me to sleep at night. Love really does not insist on its own ways. For if it did, mom probably would get more sleep. 
than going in to kiss Claire at night. But love looks to the needs of others. Billy, who is four, says, when someone loves you the way they say your name is different, you just know that your name is safe in their mouth. And I'm in awe of this image. I don't know what else, else to say other than, um, how sweet is that? The idea that your name is safe in someone else's mouth if they love you. Okay, I'm gonna give you one more example. And I'm gonna save one example in specific for next week. So you'll have to join us next week for worship because I've got a, a really good one I wanna share next week um, as we consider what Jesus really means when he commands us to not only love our neighbors, but to love our enemies. So we'll talk more about that next week. But here's a great one. Uh, one more example that perhaps the Corinthian Christ followers could have used. Eight-year-old Jessica says, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. Our differences in opinions, our quarrelings, our issues, no matter how important they may feel in the moment, they will all pass. What won't pass is our love. And while Paul's 13th chapter is a great reminder for those who are entering marriage or for families of any kind, particularly those with siblings who don't always get along, Paul's words are essential also for churches like us. Because at times, if we forget that love endures forever, we may not look a whole lot different from the quarreling church of Corinth. When we discuss our missional strategies, we could argue about who deserves our attention and care more. We could, and some churches do spend more time arguing how service ought to be done rather than actually spending time serving. Or if we spend so much time worrying about saving up enough money rather than realizing that part of the work of stewardship is also the giving and the sharing of our money, then we may forget that our money does not last but our generous love does. And as we begin conversations about returning to worship, we could spend a lot of time quarreling about when, how, and what it looks like to return, or we could drown in the pity of wishing we would have returned sooner, or we could spend time relearning and remembering what it means to be practitioners of love when we return to seeing each other more often in person in a shared space, but this time in a continued pandemic. Some church communities have spent so much of their energy in this pandemic arguing with each other about when it is the best time to return to worship rather than seeking out how to love each other better. And I'm grateful that I don't think that's been my experience here. I have felt your support. I have felt your love. I have felt that you too are wrestling with these difficult questions that are right in front of us right in our midst. My hope is that while we will sometimes get it wrong, while we will sometimes make mistakes, even as we re-enter this shared space, hopefully, my hope is soon, that we will do so not with vengeance or frustration, but instead with enduring love that remembers our need to receive and extend forgiveness and patience, those things that define what love is. This is the hope and the faith that I hold today as we reimagine love's purpose among us with the help of the church at Corinth and with the help of the Apostle Paul, that we not be mere theorists of love, but that we continue becoming practitioners of love because we aren't afraid to say, I love you as often as we can, since sometimes we forget that we not have such serious adult-like faith that might seek vengeance when a childlike, unapologetic approach to love may keep us more in line with God's kingdom. And that when asked if we love God, if we love our neighbor, and if we mind if someone asks our neighbors the truth of our answers, may our patient, our kind, our envy-lacking love answer for us without exceptions or side notes. May our love be fierce, be ever expanding, and be trusting in its endurance in Christ, our ultimate example of love. May it be so. Amen.
let us take a few moments now to extend our worship into our time of giving. May this time of giving be an expression of our love. Lord, we offer these gifts today as expressions of our trust, our hope, our faith, and our joy in you. We are grateful for all we have received, and now we have been called to generously give a portion. May you bless these gifts so that they help us be your hands and feet in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christ gave us the ultimate example of love in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. We are reminded of this gift of love, this gift that we don't deserve and that we are given anyway. We are reminded of this gift every time we come to this shared communion table. At this table, we are invited and we have the opportunity to welcome everyone. At this table, we meet the Lord of love in order to nurture our bodies so that we can live lives of love among and with the world. For God so loved the world, and we are lucky enough to live our lives embodying this love that is kind, patient, humble, and rejoices in the truth. 
So Christ our Lord invites us all to his table, people who love him, people who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another, saying together the confession and pardon. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. Thank you for the love that you pour out for us and help us live in your image this day, filled by your love from the cup and the bread. We are ready to ignite this world with your love that lights our path and infuses the world with joy. Amen. As we end our worship together, let's sing one more hymn. It's Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. this place, this shared time of worship, I pray that you will find um, love throughout your week and that if you can't find it, that you will be it. May you receive now this blessing. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit guide and empower you this week to trust in the everlasting endurance of love, love that is patient and kind, love that cares about justice-seeking, and love that is compassionate toward everyone you meet. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.